Welcome. Um, my name is Sean Sherwood. I'm a software architect with Kroger, and this is my colleague. Ted Tollison, also a software architect at Kroger with a focus on cloud stuff. And our presentation tonight is on how you can automate your project initiation so that you can deploy your applications to production in just minutes. So we said we're from Kroger. Uh, who is Kroger? Depending on the part of the country you're in, you might know it by a different name. Here in California, it's known as Ralph's or Food for Less. Uh, but maybe you recognize one of these banners up there. Uh, there were over 100 billion in sales, over 400,000 employees. Right. Uh, and this isn't even a complete list uh, on the East Coast. Uh, there'd be Harris Teeter. Uh, uh, there's also um, um, oh, uh, just uh, Drew Blank. Yeah. yeah um, Mar Fred I was going to say in the Chicago area, Mar it's Mariano's. Yeah. It's a really, really uh, cool store. OK, so uh, what does the title really mean of this talk? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's all about uh, deploying code as quickly to production as possible. But really, let's, let's put that in more tangible terms. It would be great if a team could start out a new project, get the requirements from the business, and demo to them at the end of that very first sprint. Well, why can't they do that today? Typically, there's a lot of setup work that a team has to do. Uh, there's great things out there like uh, Initializer that will generate code, and uh, Cloud Foundry lets you deploy things very quickly, but you still need to stitch all those things together. You need to make sure your code is in the source code repo and, and all those things. So there's the challenge. And in today's world, or at least back at our ranch, uh, that often means a lot of tickets. You've got to fill out a ticket to say, hey, I'd like a repo, and all those things. So how do we solve that? Uh, we solve that with automation. So just a quick survey, maybe a show of hands. If you were asked uh, tomorrow by your business to build a new application and get it into production, which is probably going to include additional database, some additional hardware, do you think you could do it in a month? Anybody? How about a month to two weeks? Less, less than two weeks, maybe somewhere between two days and two weeks? Yeah, that's pretty good. Less than that? All right. Yeah. A couple out there. Nice. We want to talk to you after this. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to do a demo. And in the demo, we're going to provision out a new project. And of course, that's going to start with uh, being able to uh, get Spring Boot code out of the Spring Initializer. We're going to set up a Git repository using GOGS, a lightweight uh, Go-based repository, a CIDC pipeline with Team City. Uh, and then set up some environments via PCF dev. So all of this is running locally on my machine. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Now, traditionally, Ted, if we're going to try to do this in, an, in a traditional environment, how long do you think that might take? Uh, well, you're going to need a ticket for the Git repo. Uh, and that, that's usually pretty quick, maybe a day or two. You're going to need a ticket for the Team City, uh, or well, your CI CD pipeline. Uh, so that's usually pretty quick, too at least in our environment. Uh, but then you're going to get into your environments. And when you need the application server, database servers, networking, all that stuff, uh, those are all a lot more tickets. You have to coordinate between all those groups. And you end up spending a lot of time just trying to set up your stuff. OK, let's see what this might look like. So this is Kickstart. This is an application uh, that we've built internally at Kroger. I'm logged in. It's a Spring Boot application, but I'm logged in with, uh, with myself as a power user. So um, this is what a developer might see. And it's asking, what do you want to do? Do you want to start a new project? Do you want some fresh code? Uh, do you want to retrofit an existing project? Well, in this case, we've been asked to do something brand new. So I'll click through here, and I'll ask, what kind of application are you trying to build? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to build, say, a demo application for this Spring 1 pr uh, presentation. And I just so happen to have that there as an option. So I'll select that and go on to the next page. And this is giving me a summary of what's actually going to happen. Behind the scenes, when all this is done, it's actually going to go in and uh, create this GOGS repository. Um, it's going to call out to the Spring Initializer. I do have a copy of that Spring Initializer running locally, but it's a vanilla Spring Initializer. I haven't made any customizations to it. Um, PCF Dev, which again, I'm running locally. It's going to create uh, some dev space, spaces for me to deploy to. Uh, then it's going to set up a Team City pipeline via a uh, build pipeline and a deploy pipeline. Uh, it interact with Git via command line, so it's going to actually take the code that Spring Initializer generated for me, uh, set it up, and then do a push to that Team City or to the GOGS repository. And then the last that last step will be to trigger the uh, um, pipeline. 
and send me an email, hopefully with all that information of what it's just done. So if I click next, I'm being asked some basic questions. For Java apps, this is pretty straightforward. It's asking like, what's your repository uh, group ID and artifact ID? So I'll just do some custom here. I'll do a call spring one demo. And I'll just leave the description as is and click next. And the next step is just like we were talking about going through, it's, it's asking for what's the repository name. Now it defaulted the name here based on what I had typed in on the previous page. So I'm okay with that, but I could change it if I needed to. Um, and I can add a description here, whatever I want, and then click through. Now this is actually uh, very similar to what it looks like Spring Initializer, and in surprise, it is, and that's because it's actually making REST calls out to the Spring Initializer. So this page is really just kind of proxying Spring Initializer for me, and it's using some of the information that I already typed in, and because of the application I asked for, it's able to make some smart defaults. So I'm not even really gonna change anything here and just select Next. This might be a little different, since normally Spring Initializer doesn't really uh, auto-select stuff, you get to type in the things that you want. Well, because we know you're wanting to build a good microservice, we decided to also select a few things automatically, and that kind of comes along with this. So you can see that security is selected, dev tools, uh, cloud connectors, Hysteric Sleuth. By the way, Ted, Sleuth's a really, really awesome project, so I always want to include it, so I get my logs aggregated and correlate it well. And of course, Actuator. So I'm happy with that, but I could always select or deselect if I needed to go through, get just a confirmation page, verify that that's really what I want. Now, PCF Dev, this is asking me, what, are, what kind of environments do I want to set up? So in a normal environment, you might do a dev, QA, and prod. Uh, here for just this demo, I just selected a dev or a dev and QA. So it's going to set up a space inside of PCF Dev to deploy this application to. One will be the space for dev, and the other one will be for QA. Select through that. Basically, with the Team City pipeline, it's really just asking where do you want to put this. Um, I don't have anything in my Team City project right now, so I'll just call Kickstart. Uh, the deploy part already knows all the information. So at this point, through this process, I don't have to actually start adding any more information because everything's already known. Um, if, I, if I want to customize the, uh, the git commit message, I can say, I can type in whatever I want there, step through. This is gonna just interact via Git to do the push, uh, and then trigger the final build, and then send the report. And I can do a comma separate list if I wanna send it to some of my team members, but I'll just click through. Now it's gonna actually start this whole process. So fingers <laughs> crossed, I'm gonna hit execute, and we get to see the cloud. The, yeah, the so right, right now models. it's setting up everything, well, a mini version of what uh, the project team would need. Uh, and boom, it's done. So that's the code generated, a Git repo created, co uh, code in that repo, Team City pipeline, and all that. Yeah, and so with this wrap up page, it's already telling me, hey, you already have now a repo uh, that's out here in GOG. So if I click on that, you can see that I've got the code, and it was just checked in 21 seconds ago. Um, we cheated a little bit uh, in our other plugin. Uh, we added some meta, we added, added a manifest because we know we're actually going to deploy to PCF Dev, and we also included some deployment scripts. Mm -hmm. So there's some additional stuff here, just because we know we're going to PCF that we added in um, as part of the provisioning process. Uh, I also got an email here that similar, basically this is information that I can send out to my team with with the links that they're going to need to know how how and where the, the pipelines are set up. Uh, let's click over here to Team City. Now all of a sudden this is actually building. You can see that it's actually going through its build pipeline. All of these um, uh, build configurations and build jobs were, were added to this uh, uh, when I clicked execute. So I didn't have to do any of this setup. This is a standard build deploy pipeline um, that I didn't have to, and I can, in here, oh, actually, you can see it's now. Oh, uh -oh. No. <laughs> uh, demos are fun. I think we've run through this like uh, many, many times and not seen uh, that happen before. What, can you see what it is? Or? 
So uh, this, uh, this pipeline, it's nice that the project for your build is set up for the team, uh, but the pipeline is also all configured, right? So uh, that way we can put the best practices right into the pipeline from the start. Uh, I mean, you say to teams, you know, hey, uh, we want you to do uh, testing of your code before you deploy it out to the dev environment. We want you to uh, deploy continuously. Uh, we want you to do blue-green deployments. Uh, that's all baked into this process so that the team doesn't have to, to figure that out each time they're setting something up. And you also uh, don't end up with special snowflakes all over the organization, right? This becomes a, a standardized process. But even though it's standardized, uh, it's, it's all, we try and make it white box. Namely, Sean had mentioned that the deployment script went into their source code repo. So the team can modify it uh, however they need to, to do that. I'm gonna try to kick it off manually one time, just to see. Um, again, this would uh, have pushed, you can see that it actually did create the spaces and it would have pushed the app uh, in, into those spaces. A little step ahead here. So, uh, so uh, we we just talked about kind of what the concept was and, and how it benefits the team. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how we did that with this particular program uh, that we call Kickstart. And the first concept uh, to talk about is the blueprint. So when Sean first went to the the Kickstart screen, it asked, "Hey, what kind of application do you want to build?" Uh, and those, those are all based on blueprints. So for uh, this demo purpose, we put together a blueprint that included you know, Git, Initializer, Team City, and PCF Dev. But you can make a blueprint for whatever you want to set up. Uh, so we could have included, say, some networking setup to do load balancing or, or things like that. Yeah, I'm bringing this back up. Basically, what you see here as a summary is the, the summary of this blueprint. So each one of these steps is configurable as a blueprint in the order uh, uh, in which they execute. Right, and uh, Sean had uh, selected the new project, but you can also use this uh, to do retrofits, as we call them. So you may have an existing code base, and you're interested in getting that team onto Cloud Foundry. Uh, they could choose a retrofit, point at their existing code base, but get a deployment pipeline created for them and get all the Cloud Foundry spaces created for them. And that way they can really work on their migration to, you know, say a 12-factor application or a cloud-native application uh, and uh, focus on that and not worry about all the setup work. Additionally, one of the real key pieces to making all this work is this plugin-based framework that uh, we used. We use an open source library called PF4J. I've got a link to the Git repository for that. That's something that someone else wrote. We didn't build this ourselves. We just uh, repurposed it for our own needs. Um, but we took it and we added some basic concepts onto the plugin framework. And one of those is each plugin is required to implement an input and output spec. And real quickly, if I jump back over to the application and from the blueprint, click into the next. The input spec is what defines actually what the screen is displaying. So this is all a dynamically built screen based on calling that plugin. So the plugin's input spec has things like text fields, check boxes, uh, defines required fields, what patterns they might need to re, uh, implement. So text-wise, so if it, like if I have an extra space, it tells me that that's an invalid input. I'll, additionally, the other side of that is in the output spec. So if, they, say for example, the Git uh, the GOGS plugin, uh, it's going to produce a, a, a clone URL. That's something that I can't predict necessarily at the, at, uh, before I start uh, calling that plugin. And that is what I put on to my output spec so that plugins that execute afterwards, uh, that plugin can use that value. So Team City needs to know where's the, where's the URL for me to go check that code out. So that output spec's important to be able to keep plugins kind of seamed together. Uh, additionally, there are some lifecycle events um, that happen. Uh, the lifecycle event, when you hit next, calls what we, we call a dry run. And that basically does do, basically on the data that you've entered, is this valid? Will I be able to execute this? So that might actually go out to the GOGS repository and verify that the name that you entered in doesn't already exist. So that, therefore, you should get a, a, a valid execute. That, is the ex next step is when you click execute at the very end, it goes through each one of those plugins again and actually invokes the operation that's gonna be do the, do the work. So it'll actually call out to the REST API of GOGS and 
create the repository or call out the team city and orchestrate the many calls that it did, did to create all of those build jobs. Mm -hmm. And then finally, one of the other lifecycle events that you really won't see here is a decommission. Um, with demos and just real world usage, we found out that it's really fun to be able to build a bunch of stuff, but a lot of times you might want to also tear it back down and be a good corporate citizen. So Ted's done, I don't know, hundreds of demos and the DBAs aren't always happy with all the uh, databases that he's spun up. Yeah, yeah, so decommission is important. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've got this uh, shared context concept, uh, and Sean had alluded to that, that um, when you have the GOGS repository creating a, a, a clone URL, that needs to get passed on to the CI CD pipeline so it knows, hey, where do I clone this code from? Uh, or you might be looking at the demo saying, well, I don't use GOGS, you know, this is not applicable. Uh, you can use it with uh, Bitbucket or GitLab or whatever you're using for your, your source code control. And, and that's how the plugins can be flexible because uh, they're working off of a shared context. One plugin puts the information on there, another one can uh, pull it off. And we also saw that in the deployment step for Team City, the, the user didn't have to enter in anything, and that's through the ma magic of a shared context. I'm actually going to So this time, <laughs> it looks like it was successful. So if I go over to PCF Dev, uh, we see, let me refresh this, that we have an instance running. So. I was just going to verify that it actually is up and running. Uh, and since we selected security, uh, Spring Boot automatically uh, will uh, create this temporary password. Obviously, we wouldn't do this in a real production environment. But if I go to launch the app, it's actually going to val uh, verify uh, that I am the user it expects. And um, we see the also famous white label error page. Um, Again, we're just generating a vanilla Spring Boot app. You could actually customize Initializer a little bit to maybe add a few reference endpoints, uh, things like that. But if I go to the health check now, you can see that the app is actually up and running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. So uh, we've now talked about uh, what this is used for and how we approach it. Uh, we wanted to share a little bit of the organizational journey as well. Uh, and this is uh, easily as valuable as the, the tool itself. Uh, so the, uh, the first thing this has really done for us is, is fostered a DevOps culture. Uh, at back home at your shop, uh, people may, may have said, hey, go do the DevOps. And that, that's a pretty vague thing to, to say. Um, so what do you actually focus on? Uh, this gives people a really concrete thing to focus on. Uh, they know, hey, we want to make sure that a team can start, focus on the business logic, and demo something uh, at the end of that sprint. Well, that means that you need to set up a lot of automation to do that. Uh, and that's how you get together with all the different teams involved in uh, setting up that system architecture and saying, how are we going to automate this? Uh, and then the other part of that is, is picking out your standards, right? I think we thought we had some good standards, and as we tried to automate the things, we, we found out there are quite a few gaps. Uh, and that fostered a really good discussion. Uh, it, it brought teams closer together, and now I feel like we've really tightened up our, our standards quite a bit. And then finally, um, this has really helped uh, Kroger to help modernize our applications. The, the teams that are starting out with the modernization process, uh, they may feel it's a little daunting. They're, they're used to kind of their, their traditional app server uh, running on a dedicated machine. Uh, and, and people are talking about cloud native. How do we do all that? Uh, through this process, uh, we've seen that it's a lot more approachable. And, and we've had some very rapid modernization going on right now. So Ted, what are the takeaways? Well, uh, first off, uh, we're seeking to open source this. Uh, so hence why we, we talk about the, the plugin model and all that stuff. Uh, this is not a promise that we can open source it, uh, but uh, we are actively working on that and, and hope to do that soon. Uh, but you don't have to wait uh, for that open sourcing to happen. Uh, you can start collecting metrics now on your current process. Uh, and this is a, a really good idea because then you can show, hey, you know, it takes a long time to uh, provision out everything for project setup. We can't just demo at the end of the first uh, sprint. Uh, and then also, when you bring it into your organization, you can show, hey, look at how, how much better and more efficient we are at, at doing this. 
Uh, and then you could also start working on the uh, self-service automation via APIs. Expect to get a few no's on this one. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we, uh, we had to go at this several times uh, to kind of get the buy-in on that. Uh, to, teams sometimes feel a little suspicious, uh, like you're trying to take away their job. I think they, we've seen them all come around and say, oh, actually, this is just taking care of the busy work, uh, and we can get to the better stuff. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really flipped around uh, at Kroger lately, where uh, we're getting great buy-in and a lot of great cooperation. Uh, but I can warn you, expect the no's and start that journey now, because it can take a while uh, before the team start uh, buying in. And then uh, also start working on your, your standard architectures, right? Uh, so if you're going to say, hey, we need to build the APIs, you really have to have a good definition of, well, what are we trying to build and provision uh, out there? And, and this is a thing that if you go through that exercise uh, with automation in mind, uh, even if you never get to the automation part, I feel like this is a very valuable thing for the, the org to, to converge on some good standards. And then uh, finally, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking about, hey, we would like to do this, contact us. Uh, that'll uh, help our story when we say, hey, it'll be valuable to open source. Uh, we can say there, there are actually people interested in doing this. And even beyond what we demoed, uh, there are so many more possibilities for this type of auto provisioning of the setup of your project. So that very first time to get your project up and running. Uh, we are starting to look at things like, can we apply this idea to provisioning GCP or Azure um, um, spaces? Can we um, use this to help uh, some of our machine learning uh, so that we can set up uh, data scientists so that they can run Spark jobs on a Hadoop much, e much more easily than they normally would? Um, some to talk, uh, uh, you'll see, to dump, I think, tomorrow around some serverless. That's definitely possible to set up, set up uh, via this process. And even more traditional setup processes like getting data out of, a, out of, data, out of your uh, uh, databases and have them backed up to uh, storage or data warehousing. Mm -hmm. And we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we, uh, we could take a few questions uh, from the audience if, if there are any out there. How long did it take you to put that in place? So um, we, we have our, our latest version that we launched this past summer. Uh, it's a 2.0 one, the one we built to be open sourceable. Prior to that, uh, let's see, uh, it was uh, about November of the previous year that we had first started doing this. Um, and we had the idea for it even prior to that. Uh, so um, we've been getting better with the, each, each iteration. We did the first proof of concept uh, in one evening. We, we, we knew that we were moving to Cloud Foundry. We saw the automation that it brought, and we had the idea. And so uh, Sean, uh, James Masters, and myself uh, started working on it at 5 PM. And we had the first working concept done uh, by a little after 10 p.m. So we knew at that point it was, it was definitely feasible uh, to do. Yeah, and with the plug-in framework and the blueprint idea, uh, it's really accelerated additional things. So uh, I was able to put together that repo uh, with PCF dev and GOGS just in about a week time frame. Yeah, and we've actually had a Kroger subsidiary uh, take this code and use it in their environment. They have different tooling and they're able to create their own plugins uh, and, uh, and see it work for them. So that, yeah, that was pretty cool. The question I was going to ask was, uh, what's, what's the effort to, to, uh, to port one of the plugins to uh, Jenkins or uh, GitLab or something like that? Yeah, what's the effort to, uh, to, to port the plugin to something else? It depends on uh, the individual thing for like an actual source code repository, like the GOGs. It's just a couple of REST calls, so that's super simple. Uh, the something like Team City, it's a lot more REST calls, so you kind of have to know, you have to learn the API a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, it varies a little bit. Uh, if there are no REST API or no APIs for it all, obviously that's going to be where it's the most challenging. And that's where you have these organizational opportunities to create those things as part of this process.
Yeah, I mean, that's where the tough work lies, uh, is setting up all the automation on the back end. The kickstart application is just kind of a, a simple request taker, uh, and then the heavy lifting that gets done by the, the APIs on the back end. So. I think there's a question out there. It's hard to, to see through the Oh, light. yeah, go ahead, sorry. So um, what's our process for Yeah, uh, we, we actually, long ago, uh, we had standardized on Spring and Maven, uh, and we had created an opinionated stack, uh, which then looks real familiar with uh, Spring Boot. We've actually moved to Spring Boot because those guys are pretty smart, uh, and they do a really nice job of it. But what we, what we do is we start with the Spring Boot application. Uh, we work with our user experience team to, to create kind of a standard look and feel. We bake that into uh, the, the code base that's, that's generated. That's all work done on the initializer side. So you could potentially just uh, bring initializer into your shop and do that. Uh, there's, there's good value in that. Uh, we've, we've been using a standard stack like that for close to a decade now, uh, and we've got well over 100 applications out on it, uh, and there's, there's a lot of benefit. We do try not to overreach uh, in terms of making like this huge pre-built thing. Uh, so it's still the shell of an application. Uh, the team still has to, to deliver the, the business functionality to it. But I can say that uh, the single sign-on stuff, having that set up is a good idea. Uh, standardized logging practices, that's a good idea to put in there. Uh, and the, the standard look and feel, that's another one uh, that's good to put in there for the You're teams. More than just the stack like, there's, more code there's a little bit more. We try to keep it pretty lightweight, though. Well, and actually, uh, right now, back home, uh, we have like uh, Angular Spa application as one option that teams can choose. When they choose that, they get a lot more like menuing, look and feel, and all that stuff. Uh, they get the, the single sign-on baked into it uh, via OAuth, all those kind of things. Uh, but we don't want to be overly prescriptive, so there's another blueprint where we say, hey, do you want just a clean, simple Spring Boot application with almost like nothing in it, uh, and they'll build it up from there. And so we, we give them both options. Okay, I think we're done. Uh, enjoy your evening. Yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs>